Can you guys see my screen? We sure can. It's just not in uh, presenter mode. Yep, I'll get that. All right. Okay, well, thanks so much, everybody. Fantastic talk so far. You always learn so much. I mean, I was really impressed by the Neuro Symposium as well. I'm a little bit ashamed to say that, though. Okay, so uh, my name is Vishal Janji. Um, at the outset, I want to thank um, AIOS, uh, all my teachers. Uh, uh, you know, some of them are on this uh, on this call: Professor Titiala, Dr. Narata Sharma, Dr. Basak. Um, I've, I've learned so much from them over the years, and I'm really indebted to them. Uh, my talk is going to be on post-refractive surgery ectasia. Uh, we'll discuss a bit about diagnosis as well as management. I don't have any financial disclosures relevant to this talk. Uh, briefly, if you look at the literature, the incidence of post-refractive surgery ectasia is only 0 0.04 to 0.6%, mostly post LASIK. So we really don't know whether that is rare, which would be great, or is, is it really underreported? About half of these patients, they present within one year after the surgery. Of course, it's a devastating complication. Um, you heard from Dr. Ku, uh, demanding patients uh, start with 2020, end with 2010, uh, nothing less than that. Um, LASIK is still the most common reason for post refractive surgery ectasia. PRK is uh, supposedly the least common. Uh, SMILE, there are some reports, but we'll have to wait and watch. The histopathological findings are uh, not very surprisingly similar to uh, keratoconus. There are breaks in Bowman's layer. There are uh, there's slippage in the interlamellar and interfibrillar uh, regions. There are large interlamellar clefts as well. So a lot has been done in the past. Risk factors, the biggest risk factor is abnormal corneal topography. And we are really fortunate. Um, when I was a student back in Delhi, we just used to have uh, OB scan and VKG. Actually, not OB scan. We had a VKG. Uh, imagine uh, just relying on that instrument and going ahead and doing creating a flap. We used to do one eye at a time. Um, young age, residual stromal bed thickness, pre-op corneal thickness, high myopia, any enhancements. And I highlighted that enhancements because I really, in this day and age in the United States, most of my patients, fortunately, I don't have many for post lasik ectasia or post-refractive surgery ectasia. They have a history of enhancement done at some point in one uh, of the eyes. Um, there was a parameter that was that was uh, sort of described a few years ago uh, by Randleman PTA, which takes into account the flap thickness and also the ablation done. I, I really don't use PTA now, um, although it's it can be a really useful parameter. I think uh, I still rely on a bunch of corneal topographies, especially if one of them is even borderline abnormal. Okay. Um, like we did that chronic eye rubbing, families of keratoconus and unstable refraction are other things that I, that I do not ignore in these patients. Clinical presentation of post-refractive uh, surgery ectasia, it's usually progressive increase in myopia. It happens years later. I'll show you some cases. Uh, there's irregular astigmatism, definitely loss of corrected distance visual acuity, and most commonly progressive asymmetric inferior coronal sticking. That that's what I see in most of my patients, along with corneal abrasions, uh, which we try and use more and more nowadays in these patients. Uh, I just want to highlight, I saw this patient last month who had 2015 vision on the right eye and pinholing to 2015 on the left eye. He was referred for contact lenses because left eye had a plus four cylinder. And it he, of course, you know, he had history of LASIK about 20 years ago, and he was diagnosed with post-LASIK ectasia. So it can be this mild and this, this subtle compared to this patient who had, who had LASIK more than 20 years ago, 23 years ago, I, I believe. And the, her first presentation of post-LASIK ectasia was with corneal high drops. Uh, she was treated um, conservatively. Uh, as you can see, she did very well. And afterwards, uh, actually, the high drops treated her ectasia to a large extent by causing scarring in that quadrant. Um, she did very well with contact lens filling. This is another patient who happens to be a physician, uh, and wo we worked together, who, was, who had LASIK surgery in 1990s. In 2008, he was told that he has some signs of ectasia, 
the K2s were 43 or so, a stigmatism of, of two doctors. Uh, somebody just sat on it for, for some time. And as you can see, two years later, he started to have some cylindrical error uh, in his refraction. Visual acuity went down. Um, Cross-linking had not yet arrived in the US and he was not ready to travel to anywhere else. 2012, it became worse. Stigmatism shot up to 3.5 diopters. This is when I saw him. 2016, I advised that he should have cross-linking, which was just approved in the US at that point. And again, he, he wanted to wait for some, some more time. And this is 2019 when he finally had treatment done. So just looking at how uh, post-LASIK ectasia uh, it can really, really progress. It doesn't matter what the age of the patient is. And you can see the patient was born in 1955. There's another patient who's 68 year old, had LASIK done in 1999, progressive worsening of vision. She was bilaterally pseudophagic, yak capsulotomy was done, was treated for dry eyes and was being sent to ocular plastics for lip tightening procedure. We did the pentacam and not a surprise there, astigmatism of 13 diopters. Um, so pinholing to 2020, 2200, patient did not want any surgery done. Did a contact lens trial and visual acuity approved to 2030. Patient was very happy and she was 68. We just left her alone. 10 months later, she came back. The stigmatism increased to 15 diopters. So again, highlighting that you really can't get away uh, by doing nothing in post lasik ectasia. You really have to do something. This is what we follow. It's pretty straightforward. Contact lenses. They're a part and parcel of what we do for ectasia patients for astigmatism, uh, whether that's before cross-linking, after cross-linking, before transplant or after transplant. We always tell the patients, you will see better with a contact lens, no matter what age you are. Um, patients who are unsuitable for cross-linking for some reason and don't want to transplant this, definitely go into the contact lens uh, clinic. Uh, of course, the disease must be stable. If it's progressing, we really want to go ahead and do cross-linking. Corneal thickness has to be close to 400 microns. That's what uh, the machine has been approved for in, in the United States. Um, corneal transplant is reserved for advanced corneal ectasia and patients who are intolerant to contact lenses. Uh, a bit about contact lens fitting. It's an excellent non-surgical option suitable for patients in any on any spectrum of the disease. You know, if I can quote uh, Davy Jacobs, there is no cone that cannot be fitted. You just haven't tried hard enough, you or the patient. It does not preclude any surgical intervention. It really, relatively low maintenance. Of course, the cost can be an issue. Uh, fortunately, for most medically necessary contact lenses, we are able to get uh, approval from the insurances here. Disadvantages, of course, you need a, a proper person, a proper team who can do medically necessary contact lenses. And as I mentioned, they can be slightly expensive. As I said, there is not, no cone that can probably not be fitted. We rely a lot on large lenses that sit on the sclera. You have many version of these lenses. Uh, if the patient is intolerant, you can use piggy bag lenses as well. So overall, uh, uh, you know, these patients are very happy. There's some excellent work published from South America that has shown that the need for corneal transplant in these patients with ectasia has really gone down. This is a patient who had a corneal transplant uh, after for post lasik ectasia done many years ago. Um, fortunately, the patient did not progress further. There was no further ectasia after this transplant and the patient did well with contact lenses. Collagen cross-linking, really the savior uh, these days. You know, we don't need to go into the details of the procedure. We still do uh, epithelium off cross-linking again because that is what has been approved by the FDA up to now. Uh, everybody on this call, I'm sure, knows how cross-linking really is a frame shift from a, a level of lower biomechanics to a higher biomechanics. That's how cross-linking works and stops the progression of disease in these patients. Um, various types, conventional cross-linking is what we do here. Uh, lengthy procedure takes time. Uh, you, some of us on this call will have access to epi on cross-linking. I used to do that when I was working in another country. Uh, we used to do uh, hypoosmolar riboflavin in thin corneas, which can be important in post lasik ectasia. You can do high fluence if you have access uh, to, to, to that machine. We have shown in the past that high fluence really works as well uh, as the conventional cross-linking. And I'll just briefly mention about combined procedures in these cases. So this is an example of a 52-year-old patient, LASIK done in 2003. You can see they're all like more than 15, 20 years ago when patients really don't remember who did the initial surgery. 
approximate pre-op myopia was about minus uh, 10 diopters, video acuity was 2070 in the right eye and 2030 in the left eye. This is the right eye, astigmatism of 1.6. You can see inferior steepening. Uh, the central cornea is about 409 microns um, or so. Um, Cross-linking done. Uh, these are the three things that I, I definitely um, pay attention to. You cannot, you cannot not uh, avoid thinking about the flap, especially the hinge. Um, so you really don't want to lift the flap up. Um, well, you know, you said so there are some some publications mainly from China where they have actually lifted the flap up and then uh, did the cross-linking. But we keep the flap on. We remove the epithelium. Uh, I use uh, alcohol delamination, especially in these patients, because you, I don't want to uh, uh, press too much on the eye on the epithelium just because of that flap. Although most of these patients, the flaps are are old and they are sort of strong, and do expect uh, a diffuse lamellar keratitis or DLK in some of these patients. So I don't use much steroids after my routine cross linkings for for primary ectasias. But um, this is uh, a scenario where I make exception and I saw these patients, usually on fluoromethylone, they do really well. And sometimes they need steroids for a month or so. So really these three exceptions there. Um, same patient uh, had cross-linking done. And you can see like three months down the line, you can already see some flattening here uh, in the follow-up visit after cross-linking, even in a, in a 52-year-old patient. Um, so this is the same patient, six weeks, 2060, six months, 2050. And you can see at end of six months, astigmatism of 0.5 and myopia of two and a half doctors and patient could see 2020 even with glasses. Corneal transplantation, uh, needless to say, these patients, they have ectasia that really extends to the peripheral cornea. Uh, you might need a large uh, graft if you're planning to do a, a penetrating keratoplasty, even a lamellar tra transplant, you really need a large graft because you want to encompass that area into uh, your, your graft and you really want to do tight suturing. It can be really challenging because the corneas are thin. So if you have access to femtosecond laser, it, that might be a useful tool, especially if you are performing a lamellar, large lamellar transplant. This is something that I did as a, as a fellow uh, with, the, with Dr. Tetyal uh, and Dr. Namsa, they are there on this call. We basically, uh, you know, remove the flap and, and, you know, tugged in a graft, a lamellar graft in, in these patients. Um, this was published way back, but it still works very well in selective cases. Um, a tuck in lamellar keratoplasty, uh, this is a technique that was uh, described, uh, at, of course, at RP Center in Delhi by one of my other mentors, Professor Vajpayee, uh, for extreme conlectasia and for post-lastic ectasia that involve the, uh, the periphery of the cornea and especially have a decentered cone. A diagrammatic representation of, of such a patient um, where you basically uh, create a pocket in the periphery. Uh, you can really do with femtosecond nowadays, but this was 2008 uh, when we did not have access to femtosecond and you basically could, could tuck in those edges right until the periphery of the cornea. So this potentiate, the, potentiates the thickness of the cornea, especially in the periphery, and you know these patients, they the surgery takes about two two and a half hours. I still do this once or twice a year for some patients here, um, and you know expect to put in about twenty four stitches. Uh, so very good case for your for your fellows if they want to learn suturing. This is an example uh, from a published paper of ours where we did a tuck and lamellar keratoplasty. As you can see, large graft but still lamellar, no chances of rejection. Endothelial graft rejection works really well, definitely definitely needs a contact lens for better vision after surgery. Um, not a big fan of doing cross-linking uh, with, with other things, because especially in post-lasic ectasia, but there have been a few publications where people would do PRK and cross-linking for patients who have uh, ectasia. In my opinion, we do not have definitive evidence that this really works in the long term. So to conclude, um, post-refractive ectasia is fortunately a rare complication. Um, corneal tomography is still the best modality for early diagnosis. Management really depends on the severity of ectasia and if the patient, the ectasia is progressing or not. Um, contact lens fitting, really, if you are in a big practice, you need to have access to a person who can do really good medically necessary contact lenses. That really changes everything for these patients, especially if they do not need a graft 
And you can get away by doing cross-linking and they do not need a transplantation. And if you do, uh, you really have to resort to certain special techniques of corneal transplantation. Thank you very much for your attention.